Good morning, afternoon slash evening, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to this webinar that's introducing people to the Pressbooks directory. This is a project we've been working on for a long time, and we are very excited to be able to unveil it to all of you and give you a tour for what the directory is, how it works, how you can use it to find books and other material of interest, and also how uh, records get updated into the directory. So if you wanted to follow along at home or follow along wherever you are, you can visit pressbooks.directory and see a live version of the Pressbooks directory. So what you're seeing when you're landing here, it tells you this will be dynamically updated. Currently, the directory includes about 1,700 books that have been published across 78 different Pressbooks networks that we host. In the near-term future, we'd like to add other Pressbook directories that we know about in the world, and we're trying to work with some of those open source or self-hosted networks so that they have the necessary pieces in place for us to be able to consume their metadata and display it. So we hope that this number will be growing and increasing over time, um, but right now it's just under 2,000. The first thing that I want to feature here is that there is a search feature. And what this feature does is it allows you to search all of the book's metadata. Um, and so metadata is kind of just a fancy way of saying information about the book. This is not a full text search of the book's contents, but information we have about the book. So for example, I'll start by searching for say math. What this has just done is it's done a search of the Pressbooks directory and it's telling me we have about 300 results of the 1700 books, 300 of them have the word math somewhere in them. It may be in the title, it may be in the subject field, it may be for some of these books, they might have a description. So I'll scroll down until I find the one that does have the description. So the word math appears in the description here. It doesn't appear in the title. So it's searching any of the available metadata fields to find the term math. So that's the first search query that we've done. We say, oh, that we have 300 books that have math. This, this uh, search, it may be a little bit bigger than I want it to be. So I could say, let's display 50 books on a page at a time. You'll notice that will refresh. And now I can scroll down my results and I'm seeing 50 before I see the pagination instead of say 10 or 20. So you can control the pagination results there and see how many results you want to have. You, you realize uh, in many cases also though, you might want to drill down and get a little bit more granular in the search. So for example, let's say I'm looking for a math book for a course that, uh, and what I really would like to do is not just adopt this book, but I'd like to adapt it, which means I'd like to edit and revise it. So I want to make a local copy and change it. So in that case, I need to find a, a math book that has um, an open license, a Creative Commons license that allows revision and remixing. So you can see here that there's a set of facets or filters on the side. The first one I'm going to go to is the license filter. And I'm going to say, let's exclude all of the books that are all rights reserved. And now my search results have gone from 300 to about 229. All of these books have the word math in them and have some form of an open license. So for the example, I can see this book is called the business book business math handbook. It was published uh, on this NSCC Libraries Pressbooks Network. Here's the home domain. Here's the author, Jean-Paul Olivier. Uh, the subject was mathematics. This was the last date it was updated. Here's the word count. And then over here is a little bit of other information about the book. So this is telling me this book is the language declared was English. Just to the right of it, you'll see this is an icon that tells me what license this book has. So in this case, it's CCBYNCSA, which means Creative Commons by attribution, non-commercial share alike. And this icon is showing me this book does not appear to be based on another book, which means it wasn't cloned from another press book. So it's as near as we can tell an original creation. Another thing that we could do would be to say, okay, let's look at this book here. Here's a book card. This is telling me this book is in the public domain. So eCampus Ontario has said this book is in the public domain. Here's a book from eCampus Ontario that's also CCBY NCSA, and it's for a business math class. And so I can begin to kind of filter through these results and see things that are of interest. The next thing I might want to do is to say, you know, I'm interested in a math book, but I'm also interested to see, are there any of these books that already have interactive uh, components that have already been built for the book? To look for that, we're going to say most of those interactive components are built with a tool called H5P. So let's say how many of these books have at least 10 H5P activities? So I've added a new filter. You can see my active filters here. And now I'm down to about 31 results. So from 300, I now have found there's about 30 books in this directory that have the word math in them. 
that have an open license and that have at least 10 H5P activities. So now for these books, you'll notice a new piece on the book card. As I hover over this, this will tell me this book actually has 88 H5P activities. That one seems pretty interesting. Good job, Nicolet College, and that's in Wisconsin. Way to go, Wisconsin. And if I wanted to find out more about this book, I could say, click this link, and this will take me to the landing page for this book. I could say, let's explore this book, let's read this book, let's learn more about what's going on in this book. And so in this case, the directory has just referred me to a book of interest, and I could say, oh, I like this book, let's copy the URL and let's clone it to my Pressbooks network and ready to adopt it and adapt it. That's one of the initial kind of finding stages that we can do. If I wanted to kind of take a step back and remove one of these filters, I could simply say, okay, let's remove this filter and you'll notice that filter disappears and my results are back up to 35. I can remove this filter or I could have cleared them all with one click. And now I'm back to my 301 search results again. Another thing to notice is when I start applying these filters and these queries, you'll see that the URL of the, of the directory is actually changing. So every one of these queries has its own addressable URL. So if I wanted to save this search and remember it, I could simply copy this URL. I could share it with someone and say, hey, look, here's this search that I performed on the directory. And they will then see whatever the dynamic number of results are. Um, so suppose two people published open math books tomorrow. The next time I visited this URL, we would see a number of 231 instead of 229, and it would have slightly different results. Okay, the next uh, thing that I want to show is um, I, uh, I'll start this filter over and we'll say, let's do a new search. And instead of math, I used to teach English, so we're going to search English. When we search English, I notice, oh, wow, I have way too many results. This can't be right. The reason why English is causing problems is because nearly every book is written in the language English and English is then being searched as the metadata. So in this case, I'm getting a lot of false positives. So one thing that I can use is I can use a specific facet search term to kind of say, let's only search in the subject field. So there's several of these that can be used in the search field to say, I only want to search the subject metadata for the word English. And now you can see, okay, I'm down to seven results. These seven books have the word English somewhere in their subject field. And so I've got seven results that might be a better search for me to do there. Other terms that you can use with this uh, faceted search would be, you could use license, you could use language. So if I wanted language English, you'll see that's where the other 1668 results came from. Or I could do something like um, net, which is an alias for network. And I could say university has to have the word university in the network title. And then I want the term English. And you'd see, okay, now I've got 693. Or I could also say publisher. So I want the publisher to be, let's say, Rebus. And I want to look for philosophy. So what this is doing is there's an implicit or an invisible and operator here. So this is saying you must find the word Rebus in the publisher field. And you must also find the word philosophy. And it's saying there's six results. Here are your six results. So that's a little bit of how you can get started with searching. Let's say uh, the English search wasn't what I was looking for. So let's try to go with writing. So I'm searching for writing now. Let me clear everything out, actually, and refresh my, my page. And we'll try writing. And here I have 114 results for writing. The next thing I might want to say is, you know, I really want to know um, not just alphabetical order, but I'm sort of interested in knowing the biggest writing book so I can sort by word count. So this will just, the display order is now going to be, this book has 200,000 words, so I know that's a pretty big book and I'm weeding out by size here. Or I might want to say, let's look at when the book was most recently updated. And this would be when a revision was made to the book or the revision was made to the metadata. So let's sort by recent updated. I also might want to say, let's also filter by updated date. So I only want to see books that have been updated since the start of June to the present day. So I've applied that filter now, and you can see, oh, there's 68 books that have been updated about writing in the last six months, say. Um, and then within the network, I might say, I only want to see books that are on a network, let's say, um, Oregon. 
let's look for what Open Oregon op educational resources have. So I've just filtered and sorted by a particular network to see what public books are available on that network in the subject of writing that have been revised in the last six months. So you can see we're getting pretty granular and we're, we're able to kind of slice and, and apply those facets and filters in lots of different ways. So um, one thing to note, I guess, at this point is the primary limitations of the directory are going to be the metadata that is entered into the directory. So you'll also notice that, for example, if I were to look here, the subject fields are not always applied and they're entered by the book creator. So while I might say, oh, I could be able to find all education books just by clicking the education filter, this is only going to find books that the authors have chosen to categorize as education. And many, many authors haven't been entering subject metadata. So you can see that there are actually 900, almost 1,000 books that have no subject field at all. So you can also filter and look by that. This book certainly is about something, critical reading, critical writing, but the authors haven't yet entered the metadata or the subject field that would help us facet and filter by it. So the directory, like any kind of open project, is an evolving organism. It will only be able to reflect the metadata that users have entered in. Um, which means that the next thing that I'd like to show you quickly is um, how you can change and update, if you are a book creator, the metadata that appears for your book in the directory. So uh, I'm going to come to a book that I control. It's called the Example Webinar Book. So I'm going to start by clearing out all my searches and searching for Example Webinar. Okay, so here's the book that we're looking at right now. It's a test book that I've made. Um, and here's the metadata that we have about this book. So I want this book, let's say I, I actually don't want this book to appear in the Pressbooks directory. I'd actually like to remove it because I don't want people to find it. It's still a work in progress or I'm not quite ready for it to show up in the directory. There's a couple ways that I can do that. The easiest way to take a book out of the directory is simply to say, uh, I don't want this book to be public anymore and make it private. Our directory will never ever include private books. It only includes books that authors have chosen to publish that have more than 1500 words. So if you wanna take a book out of the directory, you can make it private. Now in this case, maybe I still want my friends and my students to be able to see the book, but I don't want it to show up in the directory. So instead of making the book private, I could also come in the Pressbooks dashboard to settings, sharing and privacy, and then I can choose to opt out of the directory. So by default, public books usually will be listed in the Pressbooks directory, but I can say in this case, take this book out of the directory, please. So I've just saved that setting in my individual book. And now if I were to refresh the Pressbooks directory, searching for example, webinar, it's going to say, oh, there are no books in the Pressbooks directory with the term example webinar. That book was instantly removed from the live directory. Let's say I had a change of heart and I would like to put it back in the directory. Homan, I'm going to need your help on the back end. I'm going to change this setting here. I'm going to put it back in the directory. And before I have Homan run the resyncer, I'm, I'm going to come into book info. And I'm also going to change some of the metadata here. So what I want to say is the name of my press, it was pretty okay press, but now it's uh, just okay press. And um, I'm also going to write a new description about this book. I'm new metadata added during the live launch. So here's some new metadata about the book that I'm saving for my book. Now that I've saved that and I've told the directory, please include it in the fetcher. Um, we are right now running an updater for our whole, uh, all of these directories every hour on the hour. We can change the frequency of that, but I'm gonna ask Holman if he'll manually run the fetcher to go sync my new information. And then Holman, if you'll give me a thumbs up or let me know when that's, when that's ready to go. Okay, here we go. My book is back in the Pressbooks directory and you can see that the new metadata that I've added is now featured in the description field. So we hope that that's gonna be pretty easy for, for network managers, for librarians, or even for authors to use. The best way to improve the quality of the directory is to improve the quality of the metadata at the point of creation. 
So we, we're trying to make that easy-ish to do. So you go and update your book info and these, these changes will be synced and will become live every hour on the hour. So we hope that the directory remains pretty current, fresh and up to date. The next thing I wanted to guess a show is a little bit more in depth with how the search field works. One of the things that you may want to do um, is search for multiple terms. So let's say I start searching and I search for open education, popular topic, right? And I can see, oh wow, 341 books. What this search is actually doing is it's searching for the word open and it's searching for the word open education. I may actually be wanting to search for the phrase open education. And so if I contain it in quotation marks, this will do an exact search. And you'll notice now I have 127 results where the phrase open education returns. And then I may also wanna look for the word pedagogy. And I can see, okay, there is one book in the directory where the metadata has the phrase open education and also contains the term pedagogy. Let's say, for example, though, that I want to include the phrase open education, but I do not want the word pedagogy. I can use the, the minus character to exclude a term and say it must not include this. And then you'll see this returns the other 126 results. So those are some of the kind of Boolean operators that you can use to combine and refine your searching. Quotation marks, of course, will be search this whole phrase. A minus will mean exclude this term from the results. Um, and then if you add multiple terms, they usually will have an implicit invisible and that's being um, included there. The other thing that we may wanna do is um, let's try educatum. Now we have a typo tolerance that's in here. And right now the typo tolerance is we're allowed to have up to one typo. So I believe that this will probably return results for both education and educating. Ricardo could probably correct me if I'm wrong, but you'll see this is giving me, even though it's misspelled, there is some give for typos. And so you, you may find even misspelled terms will sometimes return a query. But if I wanted to get real precise, if I said education, let's say open education, because this is an exact term, there is no typo tolerance here. And we're saying open education doesn't exist. Neither does open education. But if I were to type open education, then it would return results. Um, I'm happy to pause here and look at the chat and see what kind of questions people have so far. While I'm doing that, Amy, do you want to pop in and introduce yourself and say who you are and what you do at Pressbooks? And Hi, everybody. My name is Amy. I am the Customer Success Manager for Pressbooks. I have met a lot of you. Uh, I love coming to these big meetings and seeing all the names of people who I have who I've, uh, gotten to know um, uh, quite well, I would say, or <laughs> sort of well in the past few months. Um, and it's lovely to see you all here today. Uh, I've, we've been ref uh, colloquially referring to this as the Pressbooks baby. So um, thank you all for coming for this um, uh, big reveal. Um, and yeah, there's some questions in the chat that I was trying to answer, but I'm, I'm happy that Seal paused now because they're easier to answer, uh, um, not, not in text. <laughs> All right, so Steve Cavello was saying, hey, it would be nice if we could add additional tags to describe our book. I just want to make it clear that the, the best way, if you want your book to return results for certain terms, the best way to do that is to come to your book information page and to fill in some of these general book information terms. So clearly the title is pretty important, subtitle. You can add your authors, editors, et cetera, uh, to the book. You can certainly add your publisher, publisher city, um, but where you have the real flexibility to declare those kinds of things are the subject and additional subject fields. So these come from a predefined taxonomy. It's a schema developed by a group called FEMA.org for book uh, catalog cataloging. So you'll see a bunch of choices here. If I were to add a new one, uh, you probably should only have one primary, but we could have many additional. Let's say I wanted to say online and you would see here are my choices for online. Or I'd be like, okay, let's look for education. What are the choices? There's a ton of different education options. So open learning, distance education, that's an additional subject field. And that will help because this is using a controlled vocabulary. This will help uh, organize books around the same topic, provided that users have used them in a consistent way. 
You also though have, um, clearly you can add your copyright license here, but you also have the ability to add a description for your book. The description for your book is pretty important because the description appears in a couple of places. The description will appear uh, on the book itself if you have a description. So um, I don't think I'm, I'm displaying a, a short description. So I'd say short description book tagline, and you'll see in a second here where those get updated. Um, but the long description uh, is included in the directory and in the metadata for the book. And that's just free text. So you can see the short description will be displayed here. Um, and then the longer description uh, is displayed here and is pulled into the press books uh, directory. So if you wanted your book to be uh, more easily findable through free text searching or through natural language search or through any of that kind of stuff, the best place to add your description will be using the description fields in book information, which you can find here. So this is the full description of your book. It's nice to have a full description because the directory will catalog that information and make it available for searching. So that hopefully addresses Steve's question there. Um, Lori was asking, does the network refer to Pressbooks instances or catalogs? Yes, so um, every, every one of these books is published on a standalone Pressbooks network. And this is the root URL for the network that is published on. And this is the name of that network. So when you search by network, each of these networks has a name. So this is the Pressbooks network maintained by eCampus Ontario. Here's the University of Michigan. So there's many, most of these are university owned or, or administered. And so that's what the network refers to. Uh, and if you were to click on a book's title or hover over it, you can see the URL and you could actually visit the book at its home location on that open Pressbooks network library. Um, do users still have to opt out of having their books in the directory? Yes, yeah, so the question there is, Yes, by default, any public book with more than 1500 words on one of these Pressbooks networks will be included in the directory unless the, the, the user chooses to opt out. The idea is the directory is a directory of public Pressbooks books. So by making it public at a certain threshold, we would consider a candidate for inclusion. But of course, users can opt out most easily by making the book private or by choosing that exclude from the directory flag. There are some tools that let network managers control this for their end users. Um, and we've covered that in another location and there's a guide chapter about that. We generally uh, caution network managers against taking that freedom away from authors, but in some situations that's the right choice for them and they can certainly do that if they want to. Um, can we remove the directory from the directory in bulk? The answer to that, Laura, is yes, network managers can. So as a network manager, um, there is at the global setting level. So if I'm, in, I'm logged in as a kind of a superpower user. So in network options, network managers will see a book directory flag. And this flag says, exclude all non-cataloged public books from the Pressbooks directory. And what this means is the network manager deciding only those books which I have chosen to put in my network catalog will be displayed in the Pressbooks directory. And what that means is that every Pressbooks network has a catalog feature where the network manager can decide to add a book to the network catalog. For example, there's a little in catalog flag. If I were to visit this network here, you would see there are really only two books in the catalog. My um, demo webinar book is not in this network catalog. So if I were to, as a network manager, turn this flag on, my webinar book would be excluded from the directory, whether I wanted it to be excluded or not as the author, because the network manager then controls. If I put it in the catalog, it shows up in the directory. If I don't put it in the catalog, tough, it doesn't go in the directory. So that's the way that network managers can control that globally. If you decide to do that as a network manager, then you are responsible for maintaining your network catalog and regularly updating which books get synced to the directory or not, which is generally why we say, hey, if you're allowing people to create books and make public books, um, unless you're 
you have an iron grip over your catalog, the director would be most useful if people's public books are there rather than controlled by the whims of an individual network manager. But there are lots of perspectives on that, so you can choose your own adventure. Cat or Lori also noted, one thing to note is um, you will also find that there are a lot of books here that are listed as all rights reserved. And it is true that when you first create a book in Pressbooks, the default license for that book is all rights reserved because that is the default behavior of something that you put in a fixed form. So there are a number of cool, interesting books that are all rights reserved because that author has never chosen a different copyright license. So Pressbooks directory will display them, but of course you can't clone that book unless you get permission from that author. So there are some books that you'll find in the directory that you would think, wow, I really wish that was openly licensed. And that's really a decision for the creator or the author of that book. But just know that the default position is all rights reserved. So that may not have been a conscious choice. That may just have been the default. And that person hasn't yet made a decision about copyright or isn't yet educated about copyright or they're just wherever they're at in that process. That's kind of what you'll see. Thank you. And Lori is clarifying my language because I probably misspoke in many points. So look to the chat for Lori's uh, more accurate <laughs> uh, statements about copyright and the statement of all rights reserved, um, which is a claim about copyright, which adheres in, in a work. Okay. Whew. I'm going to pause there for a second. And um, I'm going to say, uh, I'm more than happy to uh, take questions if anyone would like to unmute themselves or ask them in the chat. Or if anyone would like to see features that I went too quickly for or that I didn't explain very well, um, I'm happy to um, take those now. Steele? Hi. Hi, this is Anita in Salt Lake City. Hey, Anita, welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, I, I saw you at the Open Ed Conference too. Yeah, hello. Um, and I was, of course, singing the praises of press books because, as you know, I love press books. But anyway, um, I was wondering about you mentioned really early in the session that you're hoping to eventually include other open networks. Are you talking about like OTN and, uh, you know, the OER Commons books? Oh, so probably not. I think the way that, the, so let me clarify that. This directory um, will only ever be confined to the press books universe of open content. Because the, structurally, the way this works is we're, we, we have built this tool upon the Pressbooks API. And API is like a fancy, it's an application programming interface. But what it is, is it means that the Pressbooks network is able to communicate with other software tools. So what Homan and Ricardo have done is they've built a tool that's really clever. And Ricardo, uh, or what Homan built was, it says, go talk to a Pressbooks network and say, Pressbooks Network, please tell me about all of the public books on your directory. And the Pressbooks director Network says, okay, sure. Here are the list of all the public books. And then Homan says, thank you very much. I'm gonna store those elsewhere. So what we're doing is we're asking our Pressbooks Networks for information about their books, storing it, and then using this search and display tool to query the results. Um, that tool is only working with the Pressbooks API because it, Pressbooks API has a metadata structure and a format and we get all the information in a kind of standard way and we can control that because we wrote the Pressbooks software and we wrote the directory. So, um, so in other words, even, even if it's a Pressbooks platform, if it's housed on a different repository, say like OER Commons, the API is different so you can't, they can't really talk is what you're well, saying. If, if, yes. So, um, I mean, they would have to voluntarily manually opt in, like add them to the Pressbooks. Yeah, program. so so there are a couple of different situations and I'll try to parse them. So for example, we have Lori who is helping explain the copyright here in the chat. Lori works at BC Campus and they're one of the biggest and oldest Pressbooks users, but we don't host the, the BC Campus Pressbooks network. They host their own. They're doing, running an open source Pressbooks network. And right now the BC Campus books on their network are not currently included in the Pressbooks directory. We would love to include their books because they're great books. But what we need to do is we need to coordinate with the, P the system administrators who are hosting the BC Campus Network, make sure they're running the latest version of our Pressbook software that has the things we need for directory to work. Um, and we haven't yet done that. I think B 
BC Campus is waiting to update something. And then once we do, we'll verify BC Campus that they want to be in the directory and that they're running the latest version of the software. And then we would be, this number would be 79 and this number would be over 2000 because we would have all the BC Campus books. The same it's thing. A, I'm sorry, it's more of a legacy, like bringing the legacy press books directories that are independent into the press books. Yeah, and I wouldn't say they're necessarily legacy, they're just, they're, they're open source. So they're people that don't have a business relationship with us. They're just, they've set up their own version of our software. And we're aware yeah, sorry, of it. Legacy was, yeah, legacy was the wrong yeah. term, open source. Yeah, 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 okay. All right. So we're aware of probably 20 or 30 of these networks in the world <laughs> with great content. And we're trying to work with them one by one to get them in the, direct, in the directory. What we started with were the ones that we host because that's very easy for us to configure since we understand that from one end to the other. And we'd like to include more over time. So Lumen Learning has a very large press books network, for example, with lots of great books. We'd like to get those. Um, and uh, a number of other universities are hosting their own. Um, the province of Alberta does. And uh, let's see, who, who else is a big, the University of Hawaii, Billy Mankey's got a bunch of Hawaii, yeah. So there's a bunch of people that we know about and we're trying to work with them to get those books into the directory too. That would so be great. the directory grows over time in that way. Yeah, that would be awesome. But if you were to say like Merlot, Merlot has a huge listing of open resources. It's unlikely that Merlot books will ever show up in the Pressbooks directory. The open textbook library has its own database. Those books won't be in the directory unless they were published on a Pressbooks platform that is in our directory. So, so like, for example, there's a bunch of very cool Pressbooks books that are listed in the open textbook library that are also listed in the Pressbooks directory, but it's because they're hosted on a Pressbooks network that it's in our directory. So that's slightly complicated. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> The great question. Um, I see another question in the chat from Amanda Larson. Hello, Amanda. Oh, one of my oldest open education friends. Um, are there more Boolean operators? Okay, so the Boolean operators that exist right now, um, it's not really Boolean, but you can do um, quotations for exact phrase. You can use the minus button to exclude a term. Um, and you can use the, the, uh, the kind of um, faceted prefixes for license, which looks like license, and then you might say like CC, I can't remember what it is, Ricardo, but one of these. Yeah, there you go. That, maybe that worked. License is one of the terms. Subject is one of them. Network is one. Pub is one. And Lang is one. Oh, and not English. Let's try English. Um, and those are the only Booleans. There is no or operator. We aren't able to do or operators. And you can't explicitly say and. And is just implied and assumed. Anytime there's terms separated by spaces, the and, uh, and happens. Thank you. I know that they would ask me immediately if I shared that information. That's a good librarian question. Right on. <laughs> um, another thing that I didn't really show in great detail is that within these faceted searching and filters, so license, you can see all the options. You can see that if I were to just do a search query, I just want to show you some of the cool faceted filtering stuff. So let's clear this all out. And let's say, um, let's apply multiple. So I want to exclude all rights reserved, but let's say I want to say, um, I only want to see works, uh, only those four licenses. So I'm applying these filters additively so I can have more, more than one active at once. And I can do the same thing with these other filters. For those that have, like, we're only showing, oh, I don't know, I can't remember, 10 or so at a time, you can show more and keep showing more. And you realize that you're probably never going to be able to see all of them because there's so many. So you can search within a subject filter just by doing this. So you'll see that this in real time is, and then I'd say, oh, okay, I want higher and further education, tertiary education. That filter has just been applied here. And you can see that filter has been applied there at the top. Um, and many of those facets network has the same kind of thing because there are just so many Pressbooks networks. There are, in fact, more than six. There are 78 of them. Um, and the same thing is true uh, when you get down to publisher. There are you know hundreds of publishers or people that are listed as publishers. And then there are a lot of books that just have no publisher listed, so they're empty. Um, language, the language thing will be valuable. Um, again, this is, only going to reflect the good data. So 
Um, some books probably were set to default for Afrikaans. I don't believe that these books, many of these books, if you look at them, this book does not appear to be written in Afrikaans, but the metadata says it is. So that's an opportunity for this author to improve their metadata and then the directory will be more accurate. But you'll find that there is inaccurate information in this directory as in many directories. Um, so keep that in mind and um, hopefully it's a good starting point, but this is not intended to be like canonical. We haven't, we haven't had library catalog control, nor are we likely to ever because this is author, author created. Um, and then if you look down, you have this word count filter and I could just show you, you can set minimum and maximum bounds for this. So for example, I might want a book that has more than 1500 words, but fewer than 10,000. And then you'd see each of those filters are operating separately or independently. And you can do something very similar with um, the last updated, which is going to be a date picker. Uh, and H5P activities, which again is a num numerical. Storage size is also numerical. Storage size is probably not super useful for a lot of you, but it just tells you how much size it's gonna take up on your server when you clone the book. And based on, um, this is gonna indicate, if it's based on, it means that it was cloned from another press book. So uh, one example of a nice kind of query or filter that you may wanna do is, let's say I wanna look for Rebus books. These Rebus books are really high quality and a lot of them have been cloned other places. So let's say, I don't want the clones. I only want the books that are marked as originals. This is more likely to show me the Rebus originals. And then I may say, let's sort by the ones that have been updated most recently. And you can see, okay, here are the Rebus books in order of recency. Yes, so Amanda, your question was, is all of the metadata being pulled from book info? Yes. The metadata is, whatever is entered in book info is considered the true metadata for that book. It's exposed via the API, and then we grab it by the fetcher and update every hour right now. I guess the thing that for me that I've loved so much about this is there are 1,700 books in this directory, and I feel like I have a pretty good handle on what is happening at a lot of places, but I have discovered and found out about so many really incredible resources just by playing around with the directory. Um, and I expect that you will as well. So I hope that you have fun. As you find cool books, we'd love to know about them. We'd help, love to help publicize them. Um, I think whatever channels you like to use to share that information, whether it's listservs or social media, let us know how we can be partners for you and in, um, increasing visibility for great resources that you find um, and how we can help you serve the needs of learners and, and teachers um, at the institutions that you support. Hi, Steele, can I ask a question? Please do. Yes, my name is Rosie. I'm from Rhode Island and we are like so brand new in Pressbooks. We only just started building our site today. Um, <laughs> and we're having a great time. So so where like if, if we wanted our our um, users to find the directory, would we just build a nav to the directory? Is it going to be on like I noticed on the bottom of our page? our users can get right to Pressbooks guides and tutorials. Sure. Where, so are you guys gonna actually, are all sites going to automatically have a nav to this or what do you envision that, people pointing their hmm. users to the directory? That's a great question. So um, we're still discussing this. I think usually what happens is when we provision a new Pressbooks network, they get a, they get a landing page that they're able to customize however they like. Um, and many networks, I think, will probably want to do something like, so let me show you the, how Rebus or the Rebus Foundation. Um, if I look at the Rebus, here's their network. And what they do is they say, find a book, create a book. And they're pointing them to their catalog. Right. But you, what you may want to do is to say, instead of this link pointing to their catalog, you could say, find a book and point them to the Pressbooks directory. For example. Right. Okay. Um, so I think probably in the near future, we will make the default new landing page point to the directory. But again, we don't want to impose that. We think it's really up to some networks may want people to go there and find stuff. Some might, I, for whatever reason, might not. Right now, there is not a default link in the Pressbook software that points people to the directory because it's so new. But we'll probably put like a soft opt in kind of option for that. Great. Um, Thank you. We love it. We're so excited to be part of the Pressbooks group. We're thrilled. I guess the other thing that I should show then would be um, the next stage of finding something and how easy it is to make it your own. 
So um, I live now in the Pacific Northwest. And when I was searching for this, okay, there's a couple of books about the Pacific Northwest, both of which are openly licensed. So one of them is called Living with Earthquakes in the Pacific Northwest, which my wife said, oh, I want to read that. Uh, and then the second was uh, Badass Women of the, in the Pacific Northwest, which is a very cool book. This was actually a zine written by students and was openly licensed. One of my favorite stories of the last year. So this is a cool book. I like it a lot. I'd like to learn more about them. And maybe uh, I'd like to teach this and I'd like my students to add new sections for more badass women that they know about in the region. So what I would do is I would say, okay, I like this book. I see that it has a Creative Commons license that allows me to clone it and remix it. Let's come to the network that I want to use this book on. So I'll come to my little university testing network. And as a user, I would log into Pressbooks. And then I'm going to say, let's clone this book. So any user on a Pressbooks EDU network can do this. They would say clone a book. They found it from the directory and they're ready to make a local copy and revise it. So clone the book. Here's the, the place that I found the book. I'm going to call this, uh, I'll call it Badass Women in PNW. And I'm going to leave the title as it was. So what's happening now is just like our API was used to get the metadata, we're now using our API to go and, and talk to this network and say, hey, is there a book there? And then this network says, yes, there is. Is it public? Yes. Does it have an open license that allows me to copy it? And in this case, it looks and says, yes, in fact, it does. And then Pressbook says, okay, great. Please give me a copy of that book. And so we're going systematically, front matter, chapters. It's going to copy all of the public elements of that book including the images and the embedded content, the glossary terms, the footnotes, um, and the H5P activities. And we'll make a local copy on my network that I can then edit, revise, and be a living child or a, a remix or a revision of that original book that those students wrote at the University of Washington Bothell. So it'll take me you know, a minute. This is kind of a large book, so it might take a little while. But in a minute or two, I will have a cloned local copy that I can then share with my students or share with my faculty colleagues to start revising and building from. So hopefully you can see that we hope that the directory isn't just a discovery tool for adopting new material, but it really is an engine for adapting and growing to take great existing resources to more quickly meet your and your uh, learners needs. Um, and this is just a kind of quick demonstration of how that works. So what I just wanted to show is that um, this was the original book. I've just made a clone. It told me it succeeded. And this is what was cloned. Here on my local network, you'll see this is my local version of that book that's now editable. I can revise, edit. And if you visit this book, you'll see it looks just like the original, except it now lives on my network. And then I can begin to revise, edit, and make changes as needed. Now, Jim's question was, what happens with H5P cloning? So this is something that's probably worth explaining a little bit. Let me show you a sample book that has H5P. Um, a little bit in the weeds, but I'm glad you asked. So um, H5P, for those of you who aren't familiar, is an open source tool that lets you build interactive learning materials. We love H5P. It's developed by a group of Norwegians who are doing very cool work. And we've built a really tight integration with Pressbooks so that if you activate H5P, you can just create new H5P content directly from your book dashboard. H5P activities that are created in Pressbooks will live in the Pressbooks database and can be used. They're hosted here and then kind of live with your book. But when you make an H5P activity, you'll see that the H5P activity here, for example, um, every individual H5P activity has a bunch of different choices for it. So I'm going to edit this H5P activity and you'll notice over here, Jim, there are some display options. Am I going to allow people to embed it? Am I going to display a copyright? Am I going to allow them to download the content, etc.? So uh, I don't believe that cloning is impacted by turning these on or off, but I may be wrong. So I don't know that. Yeah, that, right. that, well, that happened to me, and which is why I brought it up. And I wanted all the users on the call to either know or test it. Maybe it's something with me or not, but <clears throat> it was an issue for, for us. And 
I just thought now that there's a directory st stood up and we see something like, I don't know, an OpenStax, like for example, we just, we're about to finish up with general psych OpenStax and we converted all those open assessments into H5P. So there's gonna be like 500 wow. H5P in there. But wow. if, if someone were to, if when they were created, someone said, well, I don't want them to be downloaded thinking that it had no implications downstream. Well, maybe that needs to be considered because I think at least in my experience, those didn't clone over when the check boxes were unchecked and anyways, so, so, so we can test it out. First thing is we definitely need to understand that better. I don't know the answer to that specifically. I do know there's two things though to know. One is H5P activities themselves can be licensed however the creator would like to. So to look at that, you can see that the activity itself often will have metadata. The metadata here is the licensing information for the H5P activity, which is a discrete object inside of a larger book. So you can select the right license for your H5P activity here, um, and you can add a bunch of metadata about the activity. You also can add metadata for um, individual objects included in the H5P, like images, et cetera. So there's licensing kind of all the way down. The one thing that I do know about H5P cloning is you can have, for example, Jim, you might have created 14 H5P activities. However, only those H5P activities which are embedded in a chapter, a public chapter in your book will be cloned. The cloning routine doesn't go and grab all of the H5P activities that were created. It will only grab H5P activities that were embedded in a public chapter as a way, because the, the cloning routine is intended to only clone public content. And we, we will only consider an H5P activity public if it is included in a public chapter in the book. So that might be part of what's happening. It's not, the, I don't know that it's the download button, but it's, is that H5P activity found in a public chapter or public content in your press book? Thanks, I'll test it and report back. The please, Thanks. please. We'd love to learn more about that. Okay. So, Steele, are you saying that you could have a public book, but yet the H5P is not public? Um, what I'm saying is, so for example, I could be, I could have made for, I, let's say I made a new H5P activity. I just made the activity, but I didn't put it anywhere in my book. I just made an activity. So, like. Uh, this one that I made, the migraine analysis, it only will show up in my book when I come to a chapter and add migraine analysis to that chapter. Otherwise, I've just made an activity that lives in my database, but you can't find it by visiting it. I'm not sure if I'm explaining that very clearly. Well, what I'm asking is if it's included in the book, yes. in a public book, can you yeah. set the just the H5P portion of that to not be public? No, no, um, you cannot. What you can do, however, is disable that activity from being downloaded or, or um, reused. So you can turn this reuse button off, but if the H5P activity is embedded in a public book, that activity, of course, is public. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I hope that explained that. <laughs> and that's part of what I'm trying to confirm too, Don. So, I mean, I think when, you know, I'll definitely let the team know if, because it may be an inadvertent, you know, way to do it, so. Right, and that, that has to do with the nature of kind of how an embedding, embedding content works. So you can think of it as being parallel to what happens with like a YouTube video. If you take a, you can have a private YouTube video, but if you embed it on a public website, it has to be a public video or else it won't play more or less, right? Like the, the act of embedding using the iframe is the act of publishing, making it public. Um, the page that it's on doesn't have to be public, but the content that's embedded has whatever permissions that the page that it's on has, I think is the way to explain that. All right, um, I wanna say we're getting close to time here. I appreciate so much everyone being here and. Uh, attentive audience. I'm always nervous for these, but I hope I didn't mess anything up too badly. I hope you're still uh, excited about the possibility of open education with Pressbooks and with the directory. Um, and I wanted to say, if anybody has any final questions, 
please, um, you're always welcome to email us or you can stay. I'm going to stop the recording and I'm happy to stay for another 15 minutes or so to ask things in a less uh, public environment. But thanks again for your attention and your time. Um, we appreciate all that you do.